I'm going to do something a little, little unconventional. I, I want to make sure you understand that I'm not um, by any means a preacher or a, a, a pastor or a reverend. I'm just a guy who, who they ask from time to time because I tell stories. Oh, gee whiz, this is strange. Um, and uh, so I don't want to be under any false pretenses here that I come and, and talk to you today. But uh, the journey for me is always very, very exciting and it's very, means a lot to me um, to get to do this if I just didn't have to get up here and speak. <laughs> the studying and the learning and all the rest of it is great. And I have some very grateful, I'm very grateful for some friends and family who take this journey with me by way of prayer and uh, um, support me as I go through, through this. So I have one friend, a dear friend at the back who I'm grateful turned towards Sparwood instead of Fernie today to be here to support me. But I have a sister in, in Montreal who, who I received messages from last night in the middle of the night and this morning. And what I want to do is I want to... Um, I usually tell her exactly when I'm getting up to speak and she prays for me back in Montreal. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a picture of you guys waving at me. <laughs> so wave at Jean and uh, she's going to get this, she's going to get this message and uh, be praying as I go through this. There you go. Okay. Um, the Christmas story. I, I got a call this week saying, what are you going to call your message? And I, I, I didn't know. Um, but I had been thinking about the story of Jesus and his birth and what happened so many 2,000 years plus ago. And it just, when we think about Christmas and we think about what we see in the newspaper and on TV and in the news and people complaining it's been over commercialized and it's it's not Christmas anymore and we're not even allowed to say Merry Christmas to some people we have to be careful and all the rest of it I just felt that and that I had to look at the story again and, and try to understand it and see what really happened to give it a little bit more um, more reality to me to make me understand it better um, it's it's a story that we all know, but has been changed and has been modified and has been uh, played with until really, it's really not all that real anymore. Um, the, and I want to go back right to the, to, to the beginning, to Mary, and follow her journey and Joseph's journey right through to when baby Jesus was born. When we see these manger scenes, these little things people have in their homes, or you see it in the city square, or you see in people's businesses and front lawns, you know, it looks so nice and cozy and tidy and comfortable and whatnot. And I feel that I don't think it was like that at all. So I want to start in, uh, I'm going to be following the story mostly in, in Luke. And I'm going to talk about, first of all, like I said, Mary. So Mary's a young gal. Um, she may have been even a teenager. And one day, a angel came and uh, appeared before her. I can't possibly imagine what that would be like. An angel's never come to visit me and talk to me like that. And I just can't imagine how afraid, how bizarre that must have been. And the angel said, and this is from verse one in Luke, uh, chapter 1 in Luke, uh, verse 28. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored, the Lord is with you. And Mary was greatly troubled. Well, no kidding. She's standing there and an angel is talking to her. And the angel said, Do not be afraid. Someone once told me that the Bible says, Do not be afraid, 365 times. I never counted or tried to prove that right, but it sounded good and it says that a lot so that we can know that we should not be afraid that God is with us. Do not be afraid, Mary, you have found favor with God. You will be with child and give birth to a son. And you are to give him the name Jesus. He will be great and be called the Son of the Most High. Mary's trying to take this all in. She knows the, the word. She knows the prophecy that this is supposed to happen and all she's finding out that she's the one that's going to give birth to the Savior. 
I can't imagine how overwhelming it would be. She, then she starts to protest, go, I'm, I'm a virgin, I, how can I have a child, I'm not married yet, or I'm getting married, and Joseph, and all this stuff, and I can't ima imagine what she went through. But by the end of it, she said, and this is the very end in verse 38, I am the Lord's servant. Mary answered, may it be to me as you have said. Then the angel left her. So now she's sitting there alone and she's just been told by an angel who's not there anymore that she's going to be pregnant soon and she's still going to be a virgin and she's got to get this sorted out in her own mind. She goes away for a little while and visits Elizabeth. She comes back about three months later. And the next conversation that's kind of interesting is the one that she has to have with Joseph. And that conversation or that is uh, told in Matthew. So Joseph, who was going to marry her, finds out that she's with child and and it says here in, in Matthew chapter 19 because Joseph her husband was a righteous man and did want, not want to expose her to public disgrace he had in mind to divorce her quietly he was going to try to do the right thing he cared for her but he didn't want to he knew he couldn't be with someone like that according to the law that he lived by if he hadn't done that he could it, things could have gone really sideways for Mary Back in those days, I mean, you could have been put to death for that kind of thing. You could have been stoned in the town square. But that night, or some night shortly after that, an angel came to Joseph in a dream. Well, we all dream. And you wake up in the morning going, that was a dream. I can't imagine what Joseph said the next morning to himself. Was that real? Well, it must have been quite a vivid dream because he woke up and said, this is what I got to do. The angel said to him, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid. Here we go again, do not be afraid. Do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived of her is the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. So he goes, okay, I can, I can buy into this. I'll, I'm on side, and he takes, Jesus, he takes Mary to be into his home, to be his wife, and okay, this is what we're faced with. And now, to make things even more less comfortable, these are all out of order. I put numbers on them and everything. Um, Caesar, Caesar Augustus, decides he's going to count everybody. Probably was doing this so he could find out how many people were out there and making sure everybody would be paying taxes. And uh, so they've got to go on this journey. And they've got to go from Nazareth and Galilee to Judea to Bethlehem. Roughly 70, 80 miles, best we can figure. Different reading I've done and, and uh, looked at the map and whatnot. So let's say here to Cranbrook. Didn't have a truck, didn't have a car. And the pictures we see is Mary is on a donkey. There's no, message, um, there's no mention of a donkey in the Bible, but let's go with the donkey. I see some mums around here, <laughs> 80 miles on a donkey, eight, nine months pregnant. I don't know what the terrain was like. We know it wasn't winter time. It wasn't actually in December, but probably summer or fall. And I don't know who here has ridden a donkey. I did when I was a little kid. All I can tell you for sure is they don't have great suspension <laughs> and it would not be a comfortable ride and it would have taken what three, four or five days to get all the way there and it would have, would have been to stops on the way who knows what that was like but they did as the law required for them and they headed off to Bethlehem. They get there and th there's the talk about the inn. And in the little plays we see, the kids doing it, there's always some guy, come, kid coming to the door playing the innkeeper. There's no me mention of an innkeeper. Really, probably what it was was a guest, a guest room of somebody's house, maybe an extended family member or whatever. But there was no room there for them to sleep inside because everybody was going to this, this uh, for this census. They had to go to their point of origin. That's why Joseph from the house of David was going back to Bethlehem from where his family and his, his roots came from to be counted. So there's no, you know, I, I, I had this picture in my mind of showing up at a hotel with my family and running into the front desk and I try to see how much a room is going to be and if we're going to stay there. Then you go back out and then you park your car and you move in. Well in this case Joseph has to turn to Mary and says, well I've got some bad news and 
some bad news. There's no room in the inn, but we get to sleep in the stable. And so they have to go sleep where the animals are. Now, a lot of things have changed in this world, certainly since in my years on, the, on Earth. I mean, we've, I used to have a rotary telephone, and I didn't have cell phones, and we didn't have computers when I was a kid. I had black and white TV. And, uh, but a thousand, two thousand years ago and today, one thing remains the same. A stable in a barn is a stable in a barn. There are animals in there, and they smell. And it's dirty, and it's not comfortable. And this is where Mary was and she was going into labor. From what we understand or what is told us, there's a very, very nervous earthly father of, of Jesus there helping. There's no sterile rooms, there's no monitors. In, in, in my case, when my kids were born, there were no two nurses to pick me up off the ground because I didn't do well with it. And they gave birth in this, in, this, in this stable. And there's animals around and it smells and it's dirty. And this is our savior. And they put him in a manger. And the word manger when you're a kid sounds really cute and cozy and nice, but it's not. It's a, it's a thing that animals eat out of. And that's where they took him. And Mary had some cloth and they wrapped him up and they laid him in a manger. We heard a little earlier um, about the shepherds. And the shepherds were out in their field and this really cool sort of celestial beacon of some sort and it was shining and uh, the angels came to them and the, and the shepherds came to see the baby. Shepherds don't smell that great either. Um, they had been out in, out in the out in the fields for who knows how long and they came to see him. The wise men didn't come for a while later. Um, the whole story about King Herod wanting to know where Jesus was so he could, uh, you know, he said he was going to go worship him but he was not. He, w he wanted him killed. He wanted that threat taken away. And so the wise men may have not shown up for quite some time and actually when King Herod gave the decree to, to kill all kids under two years old, that may have taken, you know, a year or you know, many months at very least. So the wise men really don't fit into the picture, although we, sometimes we see them in these little scenes of, the, of, uh, of Jesus' birth. So then when the three, the three wise men, and it might have been three, it might have been four, they don't actually say, we know there's three gifts, but when these wise men or kings show up, they have a vision and have a message from God saying, don't go back to Herod, get out of here, go a different way, which they did. And then an angel came to Joseph and said, hit the road, go to Egypt, because otherwise you're going to be, Jesus is going to be killed. And uh, again, they're faithful and they obey God. And they get up and they take off and go to Egypt. And the angel says to them, you know, come back when I say it's okay. So this is nothing earth shattering. Nothing different from this, maybe a little different, maybe a little more basic of the story that uh, we've heard all our lives. But when I went over and over in this, in my mind, and, and was preparing for today, and I like to say that when I prepare for a message, the first half is usually the same. The second half can take many different forms. It hasn't been the same uh, once <laughs> in all the times I practiced this, so this could be a real adventure. Jesus was born in a barn. He was born of very common parents. Joseph was a carpenter. He had no advantage. He wasn't born in a rich family that had education and all these fancy things that some people could have. No one could ever accuse him of having a leg up on the way he was raised and the way he was born. That everything he did was because of who he was and he was a son of God. And he came into this world to go on a 30 plus year journey that wasn't going to be fun either. That was going to be very, very difficult. We don't know much about Jesus as a child. I'm sure he ran and he played and as a kid and did things that kids did. But as he grew up, the burden that was placed upon him by his father was unbelievable. It was a tough start and was going to be an even tougher finish. But this is what 
he did for us. And this was the promise that was fulfilled to give us salvation. Fifty years ago, this thing is driving me nuts. Um, this year is the 50th anniversary of Charlie Brown's Christmas special. My very, very favorite thing I used to watch when I was a kid. I was nine years old the first time it came on. And we used to watch it every year. I read an article about it this year talking about how probably today the TV executives would not allow that sort of thing necessarily on TV. And one of the parts I remember the most is Charlie Brown is running around losing his mind. He's trying to put on this Christmas pageant at school and for his, for with all his friends and Lucy's driving him crazy and I think Snoopy is fighting the Red Baron and, and everything else. And the one thing that, the one person who was calm through this whole thing, and, and if you ever read Peanuts cartoons, as I did all my life, was Linus. Linus was the younger brother of, of Lucy and he was very smart, smart beyond his years. And through all this time, Charlie Brown is trying to figure out what the real meaning of Christmas is. And you may remember Linus, who he was the one who had the blanket, was always sucking his thumb and had this blanket with him. And now the blanket is around his head and he's a shepherd. And he quotes, he says to Charlie Brown, and he quotes from uh, Luke chapter 2. And he says, but the angel said to them, meaning to the shepherds, do not be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. This is, will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. This, Charlie Brown, is the meaning of Christmas. And when I think of that, and I think of the start of the promise that was given to us on that day, that promise was given to us over 2,000 years ago, and it's same today as it was then, and it will be the same tomorrow and 100 years from now. And that is the gift of salvation. Those of us, I don't know very many of you here, all of us have trials. All of us have troubles. All of us have lost people. Christmas time isn't a great time for everybody. It's a very difficult time for people, for many, many people. God didn't promise us an easy ride. He didn't promise that it would be, be we, we have a better job or a nicer car or any of those things. He didn't make any of those promises. He promised us salvation. He promised us everlasting life. For God so loved the world that he gave us his uh, only begotten son that who should believe it in him should not perish but have everlasting life. That's what he gave us. It was nothing more than that, nothing less than that, but you need nothing more than that. And our lives on this earth <coughs> are so short, some shorter than others, some last, you know, I'm going to be, as my mother would say, I'm still on the sunny side of 60, but only for a few more months. Some don't, don't make it past being a child. But it means so very little. It is such a small period of time compared to everlasting life. That's what matters. What happens today, what happens tomorrow, what happened yesterday, doesn't matter. As long as we have hope and we've been given this tape from him freely and completely and not in a nice way. It was a very, very difficult time. It was a very difficult journey. I can't imagine Mary and Joseph watching this, having to deal with this, having to trust the Lord in this, and then having to watch their child grow up and watching him crucified for us as was promised. And I can't even imagine what Jesus went through, but he did it. He did it for us so that we could live. So I, I wanted to take you to take away this morning, if you take away anything at all, just the thought of what the gift really is and how the gift was given. And I, I hope that I know Christmas is a, is a wonderful time for some and not so great for others. I have wonderful memories of my family, my sister who will be, is praying right now for me. I came from a big family and we had great Christmases together but we often tend to get lost in the tree and the gifts and all the rest of it. But as we 
go about our business this week and we get towards sa Saturday or Friday and we celebrate Christmas. Just remember the gift that was and how basic and straightforward this gift is. But how important it is and how what an amazing, amazing gift it really is. So that was a completely different finish than I had thought it was going to be. <laughs> I had water. So thank, thank you for listening. Thank you for inviting me here. Um, I'm very fortunate to be asked to do this. It's a, it is a privilege. It's scary as all get out, but it's a real privilege. I have to do the same thing, but a different story next week in Fernie. And uh, I don't have any idea where that's going. But I ask for your prayers and thoughts, and, and thank, you for, thank you for that. Someone's laughing back there because she knows me. She's seen me do this so many times. And if I have one thing I could say is that you should get a different microphone. <laughs> so just pray with me. Lord the Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this morning, this opportunity to gather. Thank you for everybody here. And I just ask that we go forward and think about you and think about the gift you gave us, your son Jesus. And keep, not let us keep our eyes off that. And please let us also remember those and, and care for those who are troubled and having a more difficult time during this time of year and, and, and open our arms to them and welcome them in. These things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.